This year, TYT has been making a lot of moves. Now you can too. Now how are you going to do that? You want to launch a new business? That sounds fun. You're going to change careers. Jesus and Lord mercy. You're going to need a website for all that. Lucky for you, Squarespace also making moves. You're going to go to squarespace.com slash TYT. You're going to get 10% off your first purchase. And you're going to get to build anything you want on that website with a unique domain. What are you, crazy? Go do it now. Go. Hey, TYT. I'm Nomi Kahn. We're here in Madison, Wisconsin. We've been uh, in Wisconsin covering the movement work, the reaction to the far-right extremist free market uh, principles coming out of, of Wisconsin, which have really hit workers and you know, working people across the board, um, whether urban or rural in Wisconsin over the past decade uh, under Scott Walker. And of course, you know, we, we've also noticed what's happening with Paul Ryan, how he's taken it to the national level. Uh, there's a gubernatorial race that has gotten quite heated because Scott Walker is so vul vulnerable. Uh, he is not as popular as he was possibly because of his policies. So there are over a dozen Democratic candidates vying for the nomination, the Democratic nomination of um, to run for governor against Scott Walker, and we're sitting here with one of them today. Uh, Kelda Roy's was a representative from 2008 to 2012 in the 81st Assembly District, a progressive hero champion. You know, if you Google her name, it comes up right away. Um, and now you've announced, uh, just a couple months ago, you announced that you're running for governor. So congratulations on announcing. So I, I guess I, the question that, you know, you're usually asked right away is, why are you running for governor? Well, I'm running for governor because uh, I want Wisconsin to be a place of opportunity and fairness again. I'm 38 years old. And when I was growing up, Wisconsin, we had great public schools, we had great roads and infrastructure, and there was a real practicality and common sense. Uh, we had good, clean government. And those things have, over the last eight years, um, been either ignored or um, totally attacked. Mm -hmm. And I'm tired of that. I, I want the state that my daughters are growing up in to be like the place where I was raised. I want Wisconsin to be the best place to raise a family and the best place to start a small business. And I think we can do it. We finally have an opportunity in 2018 to say no to these divisive politics that put the interests of big corporations and billionaires before the interests of every Wisconsin family. It seems like the lesson out of 2016 for Democrats is run as a progressive. Now, Wisconsin's a very progressive state when it comes to the Democratic Party. I mean, you've had a lot of liberal champions come out of this state and fight uh, for working people. How do you, in such a crowded field, in 2018, where everybody's either pretending to be a progressive or actually <laughs> progressive, or suddenly woke up and thinks, you know, decides that they're progressive, um, how do you separate yourself from, from this very large pack? Well, I don't view myself as running, you know, against the other Democrats or even really running against Scott Walker. I'm running for governor. Mm -hmm. I have a ton of energy. I have ideas for how to improve this state. And, you know, I think my track record speaks for itself. I have a long record of proven progressive leadership on issues that are really important mm -hmm. uh, to people in the state, from expanding access to health care when I was in the legislature, defending reproductive rights, um, and working on issues from the right to choose, all the way to infant mortality, um, standing up for equal pay, uh, working on public education and making sure that we're fully funding our public schools, uh, defending the rights of workers. So, you know, people can look at my track record from the time I was executive director of Neighborhood Pro Choice Wisconsin to my time in the legislature, working on the Innocence Project when I was in law school uh, and wanting to address mass incarceration and racial disparities all the way to now uh, running a, a small business and trying to beat the odds in Walker's Wisconsin, which is tilted so heavily in favor of big businesses. Mm -hmm. And all those things, I think, are evidence of, number one, uh, why I can stand out in a crowd, because I have this varied background. And number two, what my values are. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing this because I want to make Wisconsin a better place for my girls. And um, and I want Wisconsin to be a better place for every child. And I think uh, that argument is going to that argument is going to resonate with people, especially in 2018. You are a young mother, young when you look at the average age of, of those running for governor. Yes, young for politics, yeah. but older for being a mom. I'm yeah, 38. well, I don't know, I'm older, but <laughs> um, but you, you you know you you just gave birth. You have young children, and this is something I just get so frustrated because people always ask you know, the, the women, like, well, how are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? 
But it is hard. I mean, whether you're a man or a woman. I mean, I've been. It, it, the truth is, it's very difficult as a young person to be running for governor, a full time mm -hmm. job. You know, these days we've noticed being on the on the trail is they're starting early in the morning and they're ending late at night, and you've got young kids. Do you do you have? I mean, are you communicating that message out on the trail and saying like we've got to do better for our electeds? We have to do better for our working moms out there because mm -hmm. they do bear the impact of the longer hours, the Scott Walker style of mm -hmm. policies that put more pressure on working people. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, most working families in the state have it much harder than I do. Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky that I have an incredible support system. You know, my, my husband is a great partner and a great father to our kids. And I've got four grandparents who are all very eager for as much time as they can get. We've got great, high quality childcare. So, um, you know, so I feel very lucky that I have the opportunity to do this. But I think about the millions of working families out there who are working just as hard or harder than I am with very little support. And they're absolutely not getting any support from Scott Walker and the Republican legislature. Issues that I think are absolutely essential to families' well-being, like paid family leave, mm -hmm. like affordable child care, like being able to refinance your student debt so that you can maybe save for your own kids' education or your mm -hmm. retirement. These issues are just totally ignored by the, you know, Scott Walker in his 25 years in holding elective office. I mean, he's never since he was 25 years old had a job in the private sector. He's never actually had to make it. But doesn't he talk about it all the time, the well, private sector? It's funny. <laughs> you know, he, he does. I mean, he, yeah. you know, he kneels at the altar of big business mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, his wealthiest political benefactors. But I think what Wisconsinites are starting to see and what we have seen since his failed presidential run is that it's really never been about us, mm -hmm. right? His interest was always what's good for himself. How can he advance politically and achieve his own personal goals? And I think, um, you know, that's absolutely the, the wrong reason to be in public service. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm running for governor, not because I want to be governor so much, but I want to make this world better. Mm -hmm. And... And I think that, that, you know, there are a lot of people who get into public service because they care about an issue, they see something wrong in their community that they, they can step up and make better. Um, and that's how I feel, you know, as a parent, that's how I feel as a community member and a longtime women's rights advocate. Um, I think there's so much that we can work on and make better in this state. And that's what I'm, I'm eager to do. You were in um, the legislature <clears throat> when Act 10 happened, recall yes. happened. Can you describe what, what it was like in being a, a younger representative? I mean, yeah. very young. Yeah, when I was, I was elected to the legislature when I was 29, and, and at that time I was the youngest serving mm -hmm. legislator. Now we have, um, you know, a number of legislators who are in their 20s, which is great. I think, you know, we do benefit from very diverse representation. The, the period during the Wisconsin Uprising was fascinating and inspiring. Um, it was a, I think it was a big shock to all of us. We knew that when Governor Walker was elected, that he would pursue uh, fiscally reckless policies, that he would put the interests of big business over the interests of Wisconsin families. You know, my experience in the legislature and in Wisconsin generally is that our political culture is one where, you know, people can disagree, but you can still be friends at the end of it. Um, and, and people can have, you know, these policy debates that are passionate, but we're going to go about them in ways that are, are transparent and mm -hmm. fair. And what changed with Scott Walker's approach was that it became about divide and conquer. I mean, that was literally the phrase that he used, to divide Wisconsinites and conquer, as if he's fighting a war against us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, it still is shocking, because it is so alien to the Badger State. I mean, that is not how we treat each other in the state. And um, and it certainly isn't how we can go about politics. I mean, people in this state, I believe, uh, we might be liberal, we might be conservative, very much to, to either end. But at the end of the day, we should be able to talk about our differences mm -hmm. and come together where we can. Um, and I still believe that there is a lot of common ground out there among people in this state mm -hmm. and, and people want to see progress and want to see us moving forward. They want good public schools for their kids. They want their neighbors to have health care and themselves to have health care and job security. And so there's, 
I'm hopeful that, that we can reclaim that and, um, and just sort of set aside what's happened over the last eight years and say, you know what, we don't have to do that anymore. We tried it Walker's way. Let's try something different. He, he did take a wrecking ball to the public sector and to unions. And, you know, we have gone to several uh, local unions across the state, mm -hmm. and it's, you can, hear, you can hear the pain in the voices of mm -hmm. working people who are already suffering in this economy, but, you know, to see what he's done in this state, and now it's, it's being taken to the national level, and you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're hearing that pain at the national level, you know, across the country. How, how do you go back? How do you... How do you restore unions? How do you take them back to where they were in strength? And, and maybe it's not the same jobs, but how do you find new jobs for, mm -hmm. for so many working families and working people across this country mm -hmm. and make sure that they're protected? Especially in a state like Wisconsin with such history. Right, right. We have this incredible progressive history mm -hmm. where so many of the innovations that helped to build the middle class were pioneered here uh, nearly 100 years ago. Um, everything from, you know, unions and, and the labor movement to workers' comp. Um, you know, we were even an early state uh, on gay rights. And, and so, you know, when I talk about Wisconsin's progressive heritage, it is still there. It is still part of the fabric of our state. In, in terms of how do we protect working people going forward, when I talk to the labor movement, you know, it was, it's ne it was never about money or benefits or wages, although those things obviously matter to every worker, public and private sector. And we have to do better. Um, and Walker has failed on those measures, too. What it, what it really was about is they lost their rights. Mm -hmm. they, they lost their voice in the workplace. Um, and they, they felt silenced and disrespected. And every worker, no matter what her job is, has the right to be respected and be treated with dignity in the workplace. And, you know, to me, that's, that's fundamentally what this argument is about. Uh, as governor, I will be head of a, you know, thousands of workers, mm -hmm. and am I going to treat them with respect, and dignity, and uh, as partners in serving the people of the state, or am I going to try to use them as political fodder to advance my own career and interests, as Governor Walker has done? Mm -hmm. I think my record is pretty clear that uh, I'm not going to do the latter. You worked at the Innocence Project, mm -hmm. and we um, have learned some shocking statistics about Wisconsin and criminal justice and the number of, of African-American mm -hmm. men being the highest in the country coming out of this state mm -hmm. and the amount of money that's been invested in the criminal justice system here. Um, this might be a little bit too theoretical and I can't, you know, I wouldn't know the answer to it without research, but I find it really interesting that the Koch brothers, who have been recent reformers in the criminal justice system, uh, who want to shut down private prisons and come up with rehabilitation centers or whatever their new business model is. Uh, but they've, they've invested so much in this state. Mm -hmm. You know, wh where does Wisconsin lie in terms of criminal justice reform after so much damage has been done? Well, it's unfortunate because uh, there are a lot of Democrats in the legislature, and even when I was there, who were very much interested in addressing mass incarceration mm -hmm. and saw where we were going. But, you know, again, uh, Scott Walker has been in elective office his entire adult life, virtually. Mm -hmm. And as a legislator, he pushed some of the harshest laws that have caused this mass incarceration crisis. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at our peer states, they spend far less on prisons. They incarcerate far fewer people. Mm -hmm. And they are just as safe as Wisconsin, mm -hmm. if not safer. Uh, so it's not like we're getting something more for our investment. Um, when Walker was first elected in 2011, the first budget that he proposed, for the first time in our state's history, spent more on a correction system than we did on the University of Wisconsin system. And if that doesn't tell you everything about how wrong the priorities have been in the last eight years, I don't know what does. And there's incredible segregation as well. So how do you deal with yeah. that as governor? I mean, it, this is well started well before Walker. But how do you start to address these deep systemic issues in the state? Well, you know, I think if you look at racial disparities, there are a lot of areas where the state can act mm -hmm. to make it better. Um, certainly the criminal justice system is one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think now as we're starting to see 
Um, for instance, the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. it's affecting communities all across the state. Um, you know, drug abuse and addiction, really, they don't know color or gender mm -hmm. or class. Um, and, and we're starting to see some Republicans, as you alluded to, see the light and say, you know, we can't just afford to warehouse people. Right. Um, if they are having, you know, a mental health issue or if they're having a, a drug or an alcohol issue, it's not cost effective. We can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And it's and we can't afford it in human terms either. Mm -hmm. It's a moral outrage that we are just putting people in prison and, and locking them up and um, throwing, throwing them away, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, there's a lot that the governor could do if we had a governor who cared and was willing to lead on those issues. Do you think you would call for shutting down private prisons or these private contracts? I don't think that we should allow private contracting in prisons. The state has a monopoly on the use of force and the use mm -hmm. of violence. And when we take away someone's freedom, that is a very serious thing. The state ought to be responsible for that. I think when you look at some of the abuses that have happened uh, and the unsafe situation for incarcerated persons and for workers mm -hmm. in some of these private prisons, it's very troubling to me. And I believe, you know, just like I wouldn't want to have a private police force right. that isn't accountable to the public, I think when we're spending taxpayer dollars on something that's as essential mm -hmm. as corrections and prisons, we ought to have it be a state-run facility with public workers who are accountable to the public. You, you also, um, I mean, you allude to the police force. You've, <clears throat> it's been documented. It's been really horrific police um, murder, you know, of, of unarmed civilians. How do you, I mean, this is, this is happening all over the country. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this isn't unique to Wisconsin, but how do you as a governor from the top push to change and reform, um, you know, the police culture? I think that's a really important challenge that we're facing. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm an attorney mm -hmm. by training. And my dad is a career prosecutor. Mm. He also was a law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. So, um, and one of the things that I learned from him is that if you have a situation where the community and the police don't trust each other, mm -hmm. it's unsafe. It's unsafe for everyone. And when you see you know, the, this huge division between law enforcement um, and the communities that they're mm -hmm. serving and supposed to be accountable to and in partnership with, then you're going to end up with situations like we've seen where you have systemic racism and, and bias mm -hmm. that every person has. You know, we, we have to do our best to bias. overcome yeah. implicit bias and um, name it and recognize it. And it can be very volatile and lead to the kind of, you know, terrible uh, situations that we've seen with not just African American men and women, but Native American mm -hmm. Um, people and even white people. You know, we saw in the Twin Cities where a, a white woman called the police and ended up being shot mm. by police. We can't have that. Mm -hmm. um, we must address it. And I think it starts by uh, having political leadership that's willing to say this is not acceptable. Um, we need to make sure that our police officers are safe, and we need to make sure that the community is safe. Having kind of militarized police that feel they can operate with impunity is not appropriate. Right. Um, it's not appropriate in a democratic society. Shifting gears just a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the last several months since the Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. scandal, we've seen the Me Too movement explode. I mean, it's transformed every single industry. Uh, I pay attention to politics, and anybody who's worked in politics or in local government or state government or federal government, really, but, but in, in particular, state government, um, I'm from New York, and mm -hmm. we've had a wave of, of sexual assault and harassment allegations over decades. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an epidemic in Albany, and there are no laws to protect or rules within the legislatures to protect mm -hmm. people who come forward. Mm -hmm. As governor, as someone who, who you, know, you worked, you were executive director of NARAL, not that that necessarily gives you <laughs> the authority <laughs> to do this, but um, as a woman, who mm -hmm. has most likely dealt with this many times throughout her life. I have. Life. Yes. Uh, how are you going to make sure you're not just setting the tone, but that the, you know, there are the laws in place and the rules in place to protect women, whether they're employees or colleagues, or anybody, really, yeah. not just women? 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is something that uh, I thought about as a legislator because, um, you know, it's very difficult when you're in a situation that might feel uncomfortable, but the person that you're dealing with is a colleague or it's mm-hmm. someone you feel that you um, may have power over you uh, and your career. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in the political setting, of course, there's this added complication of how it might look mm-hmm. if it comes out. Right. And the fact that you could be targeted. Um, until recently, you know, it's been pretty difficult. I mean, it's still very difficult for women to come forward and allege harassment or abuse. And, you know, certainly if you're a, a politician, you're going to come under intense scrutiny if you say, hey, I've been victimized in this way. So as governor, I want to make sure that every worker, no matter what industry they're in, from you know waitresses who deal mm-hmm. with rampant sexual uh, harassment all the time, mm-hmm to uh, legislative aides and legislators mm-hmm. have a clear channel where they can go that uh, where they will be given the respect that they're mm-hmm. due and where the allegations that they're making will be properly dealt with, taken seriously, and investigated. Uh, that's something that uh, I think we have a lot of work to do on in Wisconsin and across the country. I mean, it sends a strong message if there was yeah. a a woman governor who's taking that seriously. Well, I, and I think, frankly, women are fed up. We are not mm-hmm. going to take it anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, women have had enough. We've had enough of a, a president who, you know, there are, I think, 17 women who have alleged that he has harassed or uh, abused right. them. Even rape. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And, mm-hmm. and the governor has stood by him. Mm-hmm. You know, Governor Walker has stood by every step of the way as the president has made derogatory statements, made racist statements, winked and nodded at white supremacists in Charlottesville. I mean, I've had enough. I think women across the state have had enough. And that's why in 2018, it's such an important moment for us to come together and say, we are going to take this energy and excitement and anger and hope, and we're going to put it to use to, towards the ballot box and elect people who are not going to have it anymore. Are there other women running for office that you see down, down ballot? Oh, yeah. I think it's very exciting. We have a special election going on right now in the 10th Senate District, and there's a great woman uh, who's, who's running for that seat. Um, of course, we have to reelect Senator Tammy Baldwin, who's been uh, an absolute champion for working people in the middle class in our state and a national leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it's very exciting. And, you know, I still, one of my favorite things to do is meet with young people who are interested in running for office. And if, you know, if a young person calls me and says, hey, I'm thinking about running for village board or uh, county board or, or school board or something, I always try to make time to encourage that person and, and sit with them um, because, you know, ultimately there is nobody else that we can rely on, right? Democracy is this collective project. We all have to be a part of it. Um, and if we just say, well, somebody else can take care of that, well, then we end up with what we've had in Wisconsin for the last eight years. Moving forward in the next several months of the primary, how do you think things are going to lay out? I mean, there's, there's, there's an endorsement process. So many people are, are new to politics and, mm-hmm. and are learning about the process. And so many people are saying, I'm going to run for office, and they're learning about the process, mm-hmm. and our viewers included. What does that look like in Wisconsin as the primary Continues well. I think um, you know the great thing is that people are looking for a change. People, uh, you know, it's hard enough for our governor to win a third term, much less one who's as unpopular as Governor Walker has become. Um, so I think people are looking for someone who they feel will be a breath of fresh air, mm-hmm. who will bring new ideas to the state and take us in a different direction. So it's wide open. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I have a very strong case for why I can beat Governor Walker, um, both because of my, my background and my experience, but also because um, as, a, as a mom and somebody who has, is very focused on the future and how to make mm-hmm. Wisconsin better for families like mine and families all over the state, I think I can relate to people who maybe traditionally haven't been that interested in politics. Mm-hmm. Maybe they've said, well, political leaders... They don't care about me. They don't know what it's like to not feel like I can find affordable childcare or not, not be able to get enough hours at my job. I think, you know, people, when they see somebody who cares about them right. and is willing to listen, 
um, they are going to respond. And, and we're going to have a new governor in January. We have a very long 2018 ahead of us. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of candidates <laughs> to work through and navigate around, um, but it's, it's a really interesting race. And I'm sure as the year progresses, we'll, we'll see more of the, the, the progressive contenders come out. And, and it's you know, important to note that of the more than a dozen candidates, you are one of two women that is running. And it's in this time, in this era, as you said, um, this is, I think, very important. I think people are paying mm -hmm. attention to that. So we'll be watching very closely. Wisconsin is, is where it's all at, as goes Wisconsin. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think we are so ripe in this moment to have uh, somebody like me with a proven track record of progressive success, of standing up and fighting on behalf of working people and of women and children. And, um, and I'm very excited. I'm getting a great response all over the state. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nomi. If you liked this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching, we really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen if you're a member, only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com slash join and you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school, and all the commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.